Uh, what I want to do is share some ex specific examples from uh, my experiences across the years and um, uh, things that have come to light where I realize there's a mismatch between my students' abilities and the environment they're in so that they haven't been able to show all that they know and access as much as they possibly could access. So they come from, I started to think about this as a few different case studies and I realized that that really was limiting because there's so much more. So it's kind of lots of different things that have happened, um, overlaps um, in, in what I've done to uh, change what I do as an instructor and the impact that it's had. So let me start um, with this one. If we think about the letter of the law and that piece on allowing physical access, uh, we might make the following accommodations retroactively for a student who uses a wheelchair. Uh, we might put in a ramp. We might uh, make sure there's a working elevator. Um, we might have an automatic door where you push the button and the door opens and it stays open for a minute or so and then it closes again. Um, we might have a wide aisle in our classroom so that they can get to an accessible desk that's saved for them so that they can their uh, wheelchair fits and they can use the desk comfortably. Um, we might uh, have an accessible stall in the nearest bathroom. This bathroom here has four stalls and one is accessible. That meets ADA requirements, 25% of the stalls, which would match approximately 25% of the general population that would need an accessible stall. Letter of the law. Check. Good. Um, uh, in, on college campuses with um, resident students, uh, accessible dorm rooms, certain percentage of dorm rooms have to be wheelchair accessible. And um, I've even seen some folks um, allow a late pass for a student who, um, you know, no penalty for coming into class late, knowing that their accessibility within the building takes a little bit longer than someone who uh, is not using a wheelchair. So, um, again, kind of retroactive, we'll, we'll fit this out, we'll figure this out, and we'll fit it in for you. All right. So these are accommodations are a start. Obviously, the, they meet the law. They're a start. Um, the problem with them is that uh, they're separate but equal types of accommodations. And separate is inherently not equal. Um, it leaves some students with less choice as to uh, their entry, the pathways that they take, where they sit. So if you have that wide aisle that goes to the one accessible desk, that's great. But everybody else in, get, in the class gets to choose where they sit that person doesn't get a choice. So that's not an equitable experience or opportunity. Right? Um, some of you came in, sat right in the front row. Some of you came in, sat right in the back row, and then everywhere in between. So you had that choice that maybe somebody else wouldn't be able to have. Um, and it also keeps the need or deficit with the individual, meaning that um, I've got this set up for most folks, and, but there's something amiss here that we have to figure out. So we want to be thinking instead about going beyond physical access to that equitable experience and opportunity. All right, so here is um, how it would look with universal design for physical space. Now, this is a little bit different than universal design for learning, and I'll explain what that means. So universal des if you want to universally design a physical space, you have this problem. Right? There's a set of stairs. A person uses a wheelchair. They can't use those stairs. So... A letter of the law solution is to put in a ramp. So there's a ramp next to the stairs. A spirit of the law solution is to put in stairways that everybody uses together. Are those not so cool? <laughs> I, I pulled this off of the internet as a piece of clip art, so I don't know where these stairs are specifically, but the first set I came across was in uh, Brussels, Belgium, when I was there for a conference, and I was just, it was three years ago, and I just, just in awe. And they're popping up more and more, and I hear more and more people say, I saw a set of those, I saw a set of those. So someday, maybe in my lifetime, they will be everywhere. Right. So universal design takes the concept of, um, for the environment, for equitable use. Everybody uses the same set. I don't have to split away from my friends and use a different chair. Everybody goes up the stairs together. They can stay together. Um, it's flexible in use simple and intuitive use, you approach this, you know exactly what to do, even if you've never seen it before. Um, perceptible information, so if there was any signage, everybody should be able to access that signage and read it. Uh, wrong, or, you know, if, if you are not in a wheelchair and go up the ramp, it's not going to spit you back down the stairs. You know, you can kind of just use it any way you want to use it, and it's okay. 
That's what the tolerance for error is. Uh, low physical effort, and it has the size and the space for everybody to approach and use it. So those are the principles of universal design. Um, so if we were going to take that and think about that same student in a wheelchair and go beyond physical access to that equitable, equitable experience, we might do things like a step-free building. So a lot of buildings designed now are step-free buildings. Um, automatic sliding doors, which is a little bit different than the door that opens. They just slide into the wall. It's much wider space. It's easier to get through than a swinging door, things like that. Um, all of the aisles are wide enough and all of the desks are accessible or adjustable. Um, all stalls in bathrooms are accessible. All dorm rooms are accessible. So I've talked to this uh, through with my students a lot when I ask them if their campus fits ADA and they go out and they explore and they check things out and they write things down and they, we look at the pieces of the law and they say, yes, we meet the letter of the law. But our campus is not universally designed. We have a certain percentage of dorm rooms that are accessible, but all other students get to enter a lottery and pick their first, second, third choice of dorm rooms. People who use wheelchairs or walkers do not. They get assigned to the certain, just those few 10% of rooms that are accessible. Um, and then instead of the lay pass, don't start without anybody. Because even if you didn't get a penalty for coming in late, you missed the first few minutes of instruction and nobody else had to miss. So your, your classroom community is built on everybody being there because that person might have had a really, really important contribution to make and everybody missed it because they weren't there for it. So this is going beyond access to that equitable experience. 